So it affects your emotions, your triggers. Your core question influences how you interact with other people. Every once in a while, um, a tool comes along and it's very beneficial and I find it very useful. And, um, and actually, I was reading a book called The Seven Primal Questions by Mike Foster. And it is a lot of research and studies on habits and why we develop bad habits. And um, I found it so useful. Like, and, and I don't agree with some of his premise and, and, uh, and certainly not some of his solutions. But it brings up some valid points, and we're going to look at the Bible for the answers to these seven wonder questions. And it's basically seven core questions that we ask ourselves from the time we are children all the way through adulthood. We're asking these questions constantly. And today is the day that we're going to be laying the groundwork for the rest of the series. It's kind of like, uh, you know, we're putting the tablecloth down, we're setting the silverware and the plates, kind of necessary. And I, I think it will be, um, I think if you, if you just allow it, I think it will become a, a helpful tool for you in your life. Not just for you personally, but I believe that this is the kind of tool that you can actually use in your relationships with your family, your friends, your neighbors, your community. Your church friends, I mean, this is a tool you can apply to everyone. My bad habit is actually, uh, and I've got several, but the one I want to highlight this morning is I am what you might call an evening eater, okay? I get my uh, nourishment at night, you might say. And uh, this, this is a bad habit. I, I will go the whole day and not eat a morsel of food. Not even think about it. I'll just be busy with my day, not even think about it. About 7 o'clock at night, something hits me. It's called hunger. And I mean I eat. I eat the biggest meal you can possibly imagine. And then I continue to snack all night long. I know some of you want to fix me right now. It's, I can just see it on your faces. Don't worry, my doctor's working on it. But I do, I'll eat Reese's peanut butter cups, I'll eat ice cream, I'll eat, I mean, just horror chips and salsa. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, it's, it's a bad habit. And so I was telling my hepatologist the other day, I said, hey, just a curious, this is kind of my eating pattern. And I told her and her mouth just dropped. And she's like, you're essentially going into starvation mode every day and storing fat. I go, oh, that's the problem. Okay. And, th and then at night when you should be sleeping and going into that deep sleep, you're too busy digesting food. This is horrible. Stop it. Stop it. And so I've been trying to stop it. But I am convinced that if you want a breakthrough, that something must break. In other words, the habits that I have been um, dealing with in my life, particularly this one currently, I've got to break it. And the reality is that it is said that 95% of our lives are spent just unconsciously. Uh, it's like we're sleepwalking. And we just go through the day Basically, living out of habit, not intention. Did you hear that? We live out of habit, not intention. Um, you have two parts of your brain. One is the cognitive part, the frontal cortex, and the other uh, is the back of the brain. And the frontal part of the brain is, is, is the thinking brain. But it's also very lazy. And so it likes to move things to the back of the brain, where you're, it, which is where habits come from. It's actually a process called chunking. It chunks these things together so that you're rewarded because when you do something over and over again, your, your brain thinks, oh, this must be a good thing, so we're going to chunk it, we're going to reward it, we're going to make it a habit. And then once that habit is literally engraved in your brain, you will never get rid of that habit. You're saying, wait a minute, aren't you just talking about breaking habit? No, you cannot 
get rid of a habit, but you can replace a habit. And that's what I want to talk about. And see, so many of our bad habits come as a result of these seven core questions. And it depends on how we answer these questions as children on through adulthood. And if we answer them a certain way, it puts us into some negative habits. And so here are the seven questions. I think you'll know why it will send you into an upheaval. Number one, I wonder, am I safe? Am I safe? Number two, I wonder, am I secure? I wonder if I am loved. I wonder if I am wanted. I wonder, am I successful? I wonder if I'm good enough. And I wonder, do I have a purpose? Researchers have shown that we ask these questions all the time. And the reason that these seven core questions are it are so important for us to look at is because they're universally asked by everyone. And the answer to them is the key to developing either good habits or bad habits. And since we don't ever take away a habit, we can only replace it, then we have to get to the root of the habit. But you will never trim your way to a better life. You can only get to the root of the problem. That's where your life will change. As a matter of fact, Romans eleven sixteen 16 says, if the root is holy, so are the branches. So as your root is, so are you. If your root is healthy, then you're healthy. And so as early as one to five years, the first five years of our lives, we are making more connections in our mind and in our brain than, it, than at any other time in our life. It's, it's like we're um, defining our identity, our b behavior, our beliefs, our values are, are actually being formed very early on. Jesus said this. He said, and I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like, a li like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What is he saying there? Unless you become like a child, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. No, he's saying, look, there's an old pattern, but the old pattern, the old pattern had its purpose, but it's being done away with. And now there's a new pattern. Because I'm here. The Messiah is here. The Savior of the world is here. And you have to shift your thinking. And children can do that. They can go from one thing to the next to the next. As a matter of fact, um, they ask 250 questions a day, right? Compared to adults who ask 20 questions a day. How many parents are going, yes, they ask 250 questions a day? If the answer to the core question is no, then we keep going back and back trying to answer that question with a yes. And sometimes when we do that, we allow ourselves to move into unhealthy behaviors to get the question answered as a yes. And so I want to talk a little bit about what are the seven core questions? What is it in a nutshell? What is it in a nutshell? First of all, as a kid, one of these seven core questions is imprinted upon you. Maybe it was, am I wanted? And the answer was no. Maybe it was, am I loved? And the answer was no. Maybe you have a couple of those questions that were answered no. But it's imprinted upon you. And once it's imprinted upon you, then you move on to the next phase, which is now 
you're continually asking that question over and over again. Through different mechanisms and different means and different ways, you're asking that question over and over and over, hoping it will be a yes. And then thirdly, you will do whatever it takes to get that question answered yes. And, and you enter into what is called a scramble. The scramble is when the answer from your childhood was no, it was imprinted upon you, and now you're moving into adulthood and you're still trying to get that answer of yes. And then throughout your life, you're sensitive to anything that might indicate that it's a no. And you will use even unhealthy means to get that question answered a yes. In your scramble, you attempt to force a yes through any kind of mechanism. And why is recognizing this so, so important? What, what's the big deal about these seven core questions? Here's the big deal. Because when you don't get your question answered yes, you see it's linked to your emotions and your triggers. And it moves you into the adrenal response. Because now there's danger. I'm not loved. There's danger. I'm not safe. There's danger. I'm not successful. There's danger. And you go into fight, flight, freeze, or appease. It can hijack you. So it affects your emotions, your triggers. Your core question influences how you interact with other people. You see, you can easily spend enormous amounts of time and energy, emotional and relationally, trying to get others in your orbit to answer your core question with a yes. Some of us are so desperate to get that yes that we find ourselves doing very unhealthy things. We find ourselves in relationships that might not be healthy just because we want to get the question answered yes. Your core question affects your choices. When your core question is answered with a no, then your choices become hijacked by the mission of getting the answer back to yes. Instead of living your life with intention, living your life according to the way God's called you to live, now you're hijacked and all you can focus on because your adrenal response has kicked in is I got to get a yes answer. And it influences how you see yourself. Because you see, if that answer is no, then your safety's in question, your value's in question, your place in this world is in question. It will either be your worst critic or your best cheerleader, how you answer that question. And maybe when your core question is answered no, or maybe you enter the scramble, the scramble untethers you from your best self and anchors you to a never-ending battle for a yes answer to your core question. And, and here's a short list of just things that might be part of someone that's trying to get a yes, they're trying to force a yes answer. People pleasing, overgiving, codependency, controlling people, perfectionism. Constantly checking your social media posts, extreme focus on how you look. Saying yes to everything, buying stuff to impress people, promiscuous sex, workaholic tendencies, constantly checking your investments, letting others make your choices for you. These are all areas that we can get into to try to force a yes, to feel good, to feel like we're back in that place of acceptance again. We start people-pleasing. Or if I just look good enough, then I'll be wanted. You see how that goes? It's just a never-ending cycle. So how do we start looking at our core questions in a healthy way? And worship team, you guys can come on up. I just want to give you two very simple things that you can do as we start this series. Next week, we'll be looking at, am I safe? What does the Bible say 
about being safe. Because we're going to God's word. Because God answers these questions. And he gives us tools to overcome each of these seven questions. But the first thing that you do is you figure out what your core question is. And you can do that. We've made it super easy. You can go on our app and go into resources and hit a button and you can take the survey. Or you can go to our website and it's on, I think it's on the front page and you can, you can hit the button and take the survey. And come back next week knowing what your core question is. And once you know what your core question is, you might think, well, I don't need to be here this week because I already know my core. Often we have satellite core questions. We have another one that's very, it, that's second. But the reality is, all the people we know, all of our neighbors, our friends, our family, they're dealing with these core questions. And then lastly, the second thing is usually blame and bitterness and unforgiveness becomes a poison to our healing when we continue to look back on our past and recognize that, man, my parents didn't answer that yes for me. Or maybe there was neglect, maybe there was abuse, maybe there was hurt. Maybe it wasn't even your parents. Maybe it was someone else scandalized you as a child or as, a, as an adolescent. And they marked you. And you've lived with that. You've lived with that unanswered question. The Bible says that we need to forgive. And that can be hard. Believe me. I know. It can be hard. But if true healing is going to happen, if, if we're really going to learn what the Bible says about how to, be, how to know you're safe, how to know you're secure, you have to first start by letting go of blame and bitterness. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. And, and let me just say, forgiveness does not equal trust. You can forgive people without welcoming, welcoming them back into your orbit, into your world. Apology accepted, but access denied. You see, forgiving someone doesn't mean I trust them. Doesn't mean you should. It just means I'm letting them go. I'm cutting them loose. I forgive you. You see, it's too easy to become a victim. Jesus was truly victimized, but he never became a victim. Because he trusted in his heavenly Father. That God works all things out for his purposes and that God always he doesn't always rescue us but he always redeems and if you can let go and forgive you'll have a brand new start for if you forgive other people when they sin against you your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive others their sins your father will not forgive you your sins that's heavy See, when we, when we don't forgive, we essentially allow that person to live rent-free inside of our head. But when we forgive, whew, the Bible says God will restore our soul. And so this morning, I just want to invite you to, to allow God to work in you and empower you to let go of some people today, to forgive. Would you just bow your heads wherever you're at in this room? If you're online watching, bow your heads, would you? And would you just repeat these words in your head? God, I confess that I have had bitterness in my heart. 
first, and you fill in the blank. I choose now to forgive them as an act of my will. Doesn't mean my feelings will change. I may still struggle with it, but I choose to forgive and let them go. God, you say that once we get rid of bitterness, God, that you would restore our soul. So now, God, in the name of Jesus, restore my soul. And just let the Holy Spirit flood over this place and give you a reset and a reboot. Thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness. May I continue to walk in that same forgiveness. In your name I pray. Amen.